Hey there, this is Anne Marie, um, and this is the Anti HR uh, channel. And today I think I'm going to talk a little bit about colorism and how it comes up in the workplace and in our society because, you know, our workplaces are microcosms of our larger society. Um, and I'm talking about American society primarily, but this applies in other places as well. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about colorism and skin privilege and the ways in which I have seen it um, show up in the workplace. I mean, all my videos and my content, let me just say this, because I've had people come in my content, come in my comments and um, criticize me for speaking um, on my lived experience and, and, and trying to uh, question the commentary that I make in my videos and saying, well, it's only based on your experience. Well, that's the whole point. I'm speaking my experience because I found that what I've experienced in the workplaces in the United States are very common to what other people that look like me have experienced. And so when I talk about it, it's also to give validation to people who are experiencing these things and questioning whether what they are uh, think they're feeling is real. And I want them to know that it is real and it is valid. Well, let me move this stuff out of the way or move this camera around a little bit. Anyway, so first, this is the Anti-HR channel. And on this channel... I talk about workplace issues, HR issues. I try to give uh, tips and advice from an HR perspective. I worked in HR for over 20 years. I worked in executive roles in HR for over 15 years. And so I like to share my perspective based on not just you know being an employee, but also managing, overseeing um, human resources in the nonprofit sector for 20 plus, um, for 15 plus years and working in the HR sector for more than 20 years, right? We count the fact that I started when I was in my twenties. Um, it's been more than that. And then when we add on how long I was in management, which was since I was about 27 years old, um, then I've been dealing with HR and HR issues for a really long time. And so I talk about these issues because I realize that a lot of employees do not understand or even have awareness of their workplace rights. And I want to help change that, especially people of color and particularly black people and black women. So I created this channel. I created my business to empower employees and especially to empower black people and black women employees so that people would be educated about their rights, to understand their rights, to understand when their rights are being violated and so to know how to assert their rights when they feel that their rights are being violated. So if that is of interest to you, please subscribe, hit that like button. I'm gonna pause and give you a minute to do it. Leave constructive comments. I know some of the things that I talk about can engender a lot of emotion in people and that's okay. Um, I hope that some of the things I say help to make you think a little bit differently about some things and it may make you feel emotional, but how you express your emotion matters. So as I always say, govern yourselves, and comment constructively because I do delete comments and I do block people. So that being said, I'm going to talk a little bit about colorism and, um, you know, whiteness, white supremacy and colorism and how that shows up in the workplace. And this is yet another third rail hot button topic. And I may not necessarily be talking about this in the way people think that I am I'm going to, but we shall see. But I'm going to talk a little bit about colorism. And first, before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my perspective about what colorism is. And so colorism for me is when individuals are favored or shown favoritism um, based on how much their skin color is proximate to whiteness. And in black people, black Americans, black um, people from the Caribbean, black people from across the diaspora, diaspora, that shows up in terms of how light someone's skin is, how, how, how much closer to white a person's skin is than it is to black. And, you know, this, you know, as all things, not all things, but many things goes back to slavery and not just slavery in the United States, but in, in terms of around the world, right? Because, you know, when black people were um, stolen from the African continent, particularly the West Western part of the African continent and taken as slaves, they were dropped off in different places. That's why I always find the conversations about who's black and who's black enough perplexing 
because it's a type of uh, supremacist thinking, right, in my opinion. Because ultimately, we're all black. We all came from the same place. And we got dropped off in different places and our experiences in slavery, whether it's through slavery or colonialism, were very, very similar. Colonialism is where the, the you know people came in and took over the country, while the people who were indigenous to that place were still there and remain there, but the powers that be are not people who are, are indigenous to those places, right? And so, and, and they're usually white, right? White Europeans or from other places, right? And so whether you call it's colonialism, slavery, at the end of the day, it was all in pursuit of whiteness and white supremacy and coming in and just taking whatever you want, whether it was people, whether it was resources, whatever, to enrich yourself, right? And to build wealth. That's at the root of it. And whatever else people have done over the years and hundreds and thousands of years to perpetuate this system, at the root of it is about who gets to control resources, right? Who gets to, to be, you know, to control wealth, to have wealth, and who doesn't? All right, that's the biggest issue. And all the other things that flow from that in the division, the tiers, the case systems, the, all of that was created in pursuit of maintaining a system where certain groups of people, particularly white males, right? White heterosexual males got to decide what everybody else got to do and how much everybody else got to have, right? And particularly white wealthy males, right? And so all of these things that we're talking about at the foundation of it is what I just said. So anyway, transported Africans all across the, the transatlantic um, slave trade route. People were dropped off in the Caribbean and on islands in the Caribbean. They were dropped off in um, South America Central America, a lot of people don't know that Mexico was a drop-off point for slaves. People were, you know, brought there. Some people were sold to other places. Some people remained in Mexico. Some people went south. Some people got dropped um, other places. It was a, it was a trading point. Um, and, you know, there are clear historical um, writings about what slavery was like, um, how, where colorism comes from, it came from primarily started with the rape of African women um, by white slave owners. Um, and so a lot of, you know, slaveholders raped uh, enslaved women, they impregnated them. And then the children also became slaves and became property, right? In, the, in America, it was very, very structured and people would do it to make, to, to make more slaves, right? So it wasn't just a way of, of, of terrorizing someone, but it was also a way of building wealth, right? Um, and so through that system is where colorism came from because then structures of caste and levels of, of, of and roles were then determined by um, the color of somebody's skin. So if someone was, you know, the, 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 the slave child of the owner, Sometimes those people would get better positions. They would get to work inside of what was considered better um, or more, more less um, strenuous or difficult positions in that they might get to live inside of the house or in closer proximity to the house, right? Um, but at the end of the day, they were all still slaves and could be sold away and sometimes were, even though they were the children of the families, right? The slave owning family. Sometimes it was the father, sometimes it was the son, the sons and the fathers, the cousins, the uncles, whoever. But the gradations in color of black people, not just in the United States, but all across the world are, relate, are, are all at the end of the day started in rape. That's where it came from. There's nothing romantic about it. There's nothing romantic about, to me, about the story of Thomas Je Jefferson and Sally Hemings. There's nothing romantic about it. It's rape, right? He raped this woman over and over again and had children with her, and those children were slaves. And that's the reality. That's where that, that came from. And there are many, many stories like that in American history. But over a course of time, you had people with different gradations of color, right? And there's stories about, you know, that some of them call, you know, people call themselves all kinds of names, but at the end of the day, that's where it comes from. And there are 
some people who were um, black who then intermarried other people, you know, who were biracial, who intermarried other people who were biracial, right? And then had very light-skinned children as well. And so some of them, you know, created whole communities for themselves in different parts of the United States and in other places in the Caribbean is also a thing. Um, there are stories of families in Maryland and in Virginia who like intentionally um, intermarried to keep themselves light-skinned. Right. So they're very interesting history around, you know, different groups of light skinned people in the United States. Some people disappeared from the South and went West and passed as white. Right. To um, have a different kind of life. So there's all kinds of very interesting stories in history uh, of the United States about um, how people who are descended, directly descended from slave owners as their parents and so on, um, lived in the early right early after slavery and so on. Some people went west and passed, never saw their families again. Um, in Louisiana, they're the people they call Creole. They're just mixed black people. They're all black people. Um, there are places in West Virginia and, and in Ohio and um, all over America. But what came along with that is an idea that, you know, the more that you looked like white, the, that you were better. Right. And so you would see you will see and you see it to this day that there are people who are um, a pair lighter in skin. Um, and Hollywood is a great example of that, because I can honestly say when I was a child, most of the black people, women, especially that I saw on television who were famous um, and considered beautiful were light skin. And this was very much true back in the 40s and the 50s. And the 60s, I think in the 70s, it started to change a little bit. Um, so, but a lot of the people, and then of course on television, you appear darker than you actually are. So some of the people that even appeared darker in person were much lighter um, in real life, like Diane Can Carroll, who's somebody I always remember because I remember watching Julia and I thought she was so beautiful. She's such, so beautiful to me. And she was one of the first black people I ever saw on television. Um, but you weren't seeing dark skin Hattie McDaniel, dark skin people on television when I was growing up. I never saw Gone with the Wind until I was an adult. So I never actually saw Hattie McDaniel on in a, in, on a movie screen until I was an adult. Um, but in my experience, that was the standard of beauty for black people. So even though you were black, the standard of beauty was still one that was proximate to whiteness. And it's still the case. Let's not pretend this is not still the case. Um, and so... Even as black people, we have also internalized the idea that light skin is better. And so a lot of people in, you know, especially famous people, black and um, uh, black men and black women have married people, white people and then had children with them. Um, and this is a, a, a type of proximity, whether, you know, people are conscious of it or not, sometimes people, I'm not saying people didn't get married because they loved each other, but under the surface, there's some of that playing out as well that we would see a lot of famous people that had um, interracial relationships, biracial kids. Um, I have lots of you know biracial people in my family. Um, in the Caribbean, um, there's a lot of um, intermarrying. There's a lot of the same things because slavery happened in those places as well. But I remember I spent part of my childhood living on the island of um, Trinidad. And I, I remember when I was a kid that I hardly ever saw when we would go to the, especially in banks, um, that everyone that was worked in the bank was light skin. There are a lot of intermixed people in Trinidad, especially, um, that were mixed with Indian, mixed with Chinese, um, mixed with uh, Lebanese, Syrian, and they still are. A lot of people descended from uh, Lebanese and Syrian are called white in Trinidad, even though they might not necessarily be considered white in the United States, but in Trinidad, they are considered white and are treated as such. A lot of the people who own a lot of the wealth there are people who are considered white, um, but they're, most of them are mixed, but they get to be, a, they have a higher case in the country than a lot of people, African people. 
And this is true in Jamaica and other places, right? So colorism, the idea that the closer your proximity and appearance to whiteness, the better you are and the better you're treating is something that, you know, it's rooted in slavery, colonialism, white, whiteness and white supremacy. And so we, you, it's not, it's not a mistake or accidental that the first black president of the United States is actually a biracial man, right? Barack Obama. It's not accidentally that likely the second black person to, to who will ascend to the presidency will be a black biracial woman right, who is both black and Indian. Her father is African descent Jamaican. Her mother is East Indian. She is black because she identifies as such, um, but she's biracial as well. She's half Indian, she's half black. The, the first president was half, his father was Kenyan. His mother was white American. These are the first black people who are getting that far. It's not accidental, right? And now there are lots of other things that play into that. I always tell people, I don't believe Barack Obama would have gotten where he was if he had not been married to an identifiably black woman. I don't think that black people would have embraced him. I don't think white people would have accepted him if he had had a white woman on his arm. That wouldn't have flown, right? Ask Harold Ford, Google him. So it's, you know, there are things that play into that, but... Colorism definitely is a thing, right, in America. And so you see it in Hollywood, you see it um, in terms of even the people who are successful, who especially early on. Now it's a little bit different, but even early on, you see it in terms of people who um, ascended to uh, success in the business world as well as in, in Hollywood, are even when they were darker skinned black men, they were always had either a white woman or a very, very light-skinned black woman on their arm. Vernon Jordan is a good example. Clarence Avant is another example. Let's not even talk about Quincy Jones. It's just a common thing. And also the same with, with black women, right? Because I'm not going to leave them out of this either. You know, Diane Carroll and 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 um, who else? There's so many. Um She's the one that comes to mind. Um, she was just some, I was just talking about this other person the other day, um, Eartha Kitt. Um, all of these people, especially in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, were in relationships that resulted in um, biracial children. Some of them were biracial themselves because I believe Eartha Kitt was, um, bi was biracial. Um, so... In entertainment, you know, what people see on television, pop color, culture and what you see on television and the movies has an impact on you. Like Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte. It's easier for me to remember the men because there are more of them that like are really, really were famous when I was a kid. And it was always, you know, and I read, we read Ebony Magazine and Jet Magazine. And I would always notice that the people in those magazines, their partners and their spouses were not people that looked like me. And that when I looked at television, the people that were reflected as being beautiful and smart and all those things were black, but they were not black people that looked like me. Now I was surrounded by black excellence as a kid in terms of my family, but when you turn the television on, what you see is what you um, believe that you can be in a lot of cases. And you, if you don't see people that look like you, it does definitely send a message to you whether you realize you're seeing it or not. So I'm very happy now with the fact that you can see more different people on television, but there is still an underlining um, issue of, of colorism that still permeate, permeates pop culture. It permeates um, who is in the higher positions. I mean, Beyonce is very talented and I would never say she's not, but I don't believe she'd be as famous as she is if she didn't look the way that she does, right? Because let's face it, there are lots of singers who can who are better singers than she is but they're not as famous as she is. And part of it is how she looks. It, and that's not taken away from her work ethic, her talent. I think she's incredibly talented. And I think she's a hard worker. It's very clear that woman works really hard for everything that she has. So I'm not taking that away from her, but we cannot pretend that the way she looks didn't help her, right? So light, light skin is valued in America and in the black community. 
right? We are the biggest perpetuators of it. And, and, we, and we value it and we treat people with light skin better in a lot of ways than we do people who are not. The people who are dark skin are still considered the very bottom, even in the black community, especially when they're black women. Um, and so this stuff shows up. And then there, of course, I would never say that there's not a reverse of that where sometimes people also make assumptions when someone is light skin that they are going to behave in a certain way, present in a certain way, act in a certain way. That is not always the case and it's not fair because they walk in and their assumptions put on them expecting that they're not going to be um, as supportive of their race as others. But the reality is that a lot of advancements that black people made during the civil rights era and before that and since that has been by people who were biracial or people who were mixed, or people who were light-skinned. Malcolm X was a very light-skinned man. He's probably the person I revere more than anyone else in Black American history, who's probably had the most, the biggest impact on me and my way of thinking about who I am and why I am. And he was a light-skinned man, but he was a light-skinned Black man that loved Blackness, loved Black people, and lived and died for the liberation of Black people, right? So there are a lot of people who are light-skinned who have done a lot, who have literally died to advance the interest of Black people, right? There is a gentleman named Walter White. You can Google him. He was very active in the NAACP. Walter White looked like a white man. But Walter White used his white, his, his white appearance. He identified as a Black man his entire life. But he would use his white appearance to go into places that Black presenting people couldn't go and then document the instances of racism across the South and in other parts of the United States. Um, I don't think Walter White gets enough credit. People don't talk enough about Walter White, but you can Google Walter White NAACP and you'll learn more about him. Um, and there are countless people, right, who are light-skinned. So this is not this is not gonna be a video where I bash light-skinned people. It's gonna be a video that talks about the reality that there is skin privilege and it's all at the end of the day, something created and perpetuated by white people first, and they still perpetuate it because they control the entertainment industry. They control the music industry. We don't control any of those things, right? And so these are things that we have to understand, though, how they operate and how they impact how we interact with each other as black people and how we interact with each other in the workplace, right? But I think one of the biggest issues is that because of many of us have seen throughout our lives that there is people favoritism that happens right whether it starts you know i think i first noticed it when i was in school when i was in in school right that there are people that got treated better by the teacher right um the people got things and and then you finally realize it was because of how they looked right and i think it's around middle school i think that's the age where you begin to notice that there are differences in the way that people are treated right and then it, it, it shows up in your workplace. So when you start looking at who gets hired sometimes in certain roles and who gets certain um, privileges and advancements within the groups of people of color in your office, um, you notice that there's some colorism, right? And you know, colorism is a huge issue in the Indian community, the South, Southeast you know, Asian community. I mean, you, could, you can go read, if you read the book Case, which I will, um, link to this video because I think it, it, if there's one book that I think every person should read, especially every black person, right? But everybody, every human being on the face of the earth, especially American citizens should read this book Case by Isabel, Isabel um, Wilkerson. But she really breaks down and explains um, the, India, the case system that exists in India and its similarities to the case system that exists in the United States of America. It's really something. It's a hard read. It's a hard book to read. It took me a while to get through. Actually, I'm, I'm near the end of it. I have to read it in little segments because it really is hard to read. It's, it's painful, but it's necessary in order to understand the system in which we are operating and what we are up against as Black people in the United States of America and elsewhere. You have to realize and understand the system that you're operating in. So I highly recommend that everyone read it. But there's a lot of, of colorism. Like It's very much structured and entrenched in Indian society. And so sometimes, you know, when we don't understand people that we interact with at work, it's because we don't understand their backgrounds and their history. And it helps to educate yourself about it.
it benefits you to understand where people are coming from. And so if you understand the case system in India and how entrenched it is and how badly dark skinned people that belong to very specific groups are treated, you will understand certain things about the interactions that you have with Southeast Indian people and immigrants in the United States, right? So I think it's important um, to read that book and it gives a context to a lot of things that we experience that we don't understand. But And there are many other books, but I think that book is a really good one. Um, but I noticed many, many times, and, and even, this was before I even was in a position to make hiring decisions and be engaged with HR in the way that I was later in my career, but I did notice, I remember when I was young, noticing um, that you know certain people got were working in certain positions, right? And that there was a hierarchy. I mean, there's a hierarchy on color. There's a hierarchy based on people's physical um, attractiveness, how close they are to what people consider attractive, which is based again on white Eurocentric principles, right? That people would get opportunities, people would get hired. Um, I remember working at a, a company where this person was hired and she was biracial and she was very proud to you want everybody to know that her father was German and you know whatever and she really believed that it somehow um entitled her to certain things that that you should only be entitled for because you worked for it not because of what you look like but it was very clear to me that she was hired in part because of what she looked like because she was very attractive by european standards very pretty um and she came into the interview and i could see how you know certain people were fawning all over her and so I remember knowing like when she left, even though there were other people who came in and interviewed and were way more qualified, I knew that she was going to get the job. And these were all white women doing the hiring. Um, I knew this particular person was going to get the job and she did. And she wasn't very good and it didn't work out and she didn't last. But the reason she got the job in the first place was what had less to do with her qualifications and more to do with what she looked like, right? And so she was black, but she was an acceptable black to them for the role that was going to be a management role to put her in there. But she didn't have the qualifications and the skills, so she crashed and burned. And um, it would not be the last time that I would see something like that occur. But later in my career, I was in a position to call it out if I saw it. But I, you know, when I was younger, I wasn't. It was just me in a room taking notes and observing. Um, but these things happen all the time because there is bias. There is bias based on, you know, colorism. And it's a, a bias that can be very unconscious a lot, even in terms of black people making hiring decisions, right? That you will see that people will um, choose people. And you're looking at the resumes and you're like, why is this person pushing this person? Why is this person think that, you know, that they're so articulate and they're so this and they're, they're so that. And it had to do with, you know, the other, this person's very light skin and, you know, the, they, they, they are closer approximation to white than the other candidate. And so people want to hire that person and not the other person. And they don't even necessarily realize that that's what has something to do with it. But it's a factor, right? But the biggest issue to me is the way that sometimes we get pitted against each other in the workplace on the basis of that. And I know a lot of times in places that are have a higher... Um, number of black people in positions of authority this can show up a lot and that we're not even getting into the whole sororities black sororities and fraternities and the colorism and stuff that permeates that and then people a lot of times especially in predominantly black settings and institutions and professional especially corporate environments that's playing a role too that people are being biased in terms of hiring people because they're their sorority sister or they're their their frat brother and all of them look the same way because the fraternity only takes people that look a certain way. So you've got that going on too, right? And I know when I just started getting into corporate, I, you know, I've never been a sorority. I, I, I had someone try to recruit me um, when I was in DC and co just finishing college there. And I was absolutely not interested. I think she was a Delta. I was absolutely not interested because I had, I had seen school days <laughs> and after seeing that, I didn't want no part of no sorority. Right. So, you know, 
I was, you know, because it's not something that I really knew that much about until I saw School Days. And then when I saw School Days, I was like, I don't want to be in no sorority. I don't want to be in no club. I've never been a clicky person. I've never been a person that wanted to be in clubs and groups and cliques and do something because everybody else was doing it. So the idea of it just didn't make sense to me. Um, I have friends who have pledged as adults. I've been approached about pledging as an adult. And I also declined the second time I was approached about it later in my professional career. It's just not something that interests me. I don't think it's bad per se, but it's just not something that has ever interested me. Uh, I'm not surprised that it's likely that the first black um, and Asian woman to be president of the United States will be in a black sorority, right? I think she's an AKA, right? Um, but there's a lot of colorism in there. And when you consider how many of them end up in corporate management roles, you're up dealing with that. It, it's part of a lot, a big part of, um, some of those groups. I'm not saying all of them. I'm not saying in every instance, but it is a thing and let's not pretend it's not. So a lot of these things creep in, right? People hire their, their, their friends, they hire their sorority, um, siblings, and they create cliques and division in corporate settings just based on that. And then you've got the colorism underneath that, right? And so you've got people who are in, in you know, engaging in behavior that is biased and discriminatory against other people that are black, just like them, but they're doing it on a basis of skin color. And it happens in corporate work environments. No one ever really talks about it, but it's a thing. Black people don't really talk about it. We don't like to talk about this in, in company, but it's a thing. We see it in our families. I remember being told when, or not even being told, but overhearing someone complimenting me when I was six, seven. I always remembered it. I was sitting in my father's lap. We were in a, I was tired. We were in a hall somewhere. We were in the Caribbean. No, so I would have been older because we were in the Caribbean. I was like nine or 10 and I was sitting in my dad's lap. I was tired and I heard someone tell, my mom was sitting next to my dad and I heard someone tell my mom, that I was very pretty and if I had been lighter, I would really be something or something to that, ex um, you know, they were trying to be complimentary, but they weren't being complimentary because they basically were saying I was pretty, but I would be prettier if I was light skin. And I've never forgotten it. And I was nine, probably nine going on 10 when that happened, right? And I know that, you know, in my family and other families, people can always tell you about every white person that was ever in the family, like in the, in ancestrally, they don't talk that much about the black people, but they could tell you every Irishman, Scotsman, you know, who, whatever was in the family to explain why someone has straight hair, why someone has green eyes, why someone has whatever. And we're very, I'm very proud of it. Right. And not making the connection between that and slavery, right. Or other things but very proud of, you know, whatever light skinned person and, and the favoritism sometimes that the relatives and the cousins and the whatever who had lighter skin would receive. And I've seen it in my own family and I've seen it elsewhere, right? And so it is a thing and it is a thing that we as black people are big perpetuators of at work and in our families and elsewhere. So it's no surprise that in the workplace, you will see people get hired and sometimes the people doing the hire are, people, are black people, but they will hire the light skinned person over the dark skinned person. And sometimes the dark skinned people will, will engage in uh, mistreatment of people who are light skinned in the workplace because they resent them because of whatever they think happened um, before or something that happened to them when they're in school or something that happened to them when they were younger or their mother liked their light skinned sister better. All of these things show up at work. It's a real thing and it shows up at work. And it's a harder thing to put your finger in. It's an finger on. It's an even harder thing to prove. But it's a real thing, right? And so when people ask me, you know, someone recently made a comment and they asked me, did I think that if black people created their own businesses and hired each other, they would we would have better work environments? And my answer was yes and no. And the no is that if we don't acknowledge that we have these issues, and act intentionally and actively to eradicate them, to identify them, acknowledge them, and correct them, 
We won't make better, we won't make better work environments than anybody else does. Cause we just going to do the same stuff. We just going to do it to each other. Right. Because I know people that work in predominantly black work environments. I mean, if you live in, you work in a, live and work in a DC area, which is where I lived before I left the United States, there are lots of environments in which black people, at least before gentrification, if you worked in DC government, if you worked in a lot of um, smaller um, nonprofit institutions, a lot of them were black led. And the work environments, a lot of them work environments were very toxic, very, very toxic. I worked in an environment where um, I worked in a department at a company that was the, the one majority black and was black led. My um, boss was a black man. He was wonderful. He perpetuated and created a good collaborative work environment. But there were some women that worked in that department, black women, and they were horrible. They were horrible to each other. And he, as the leader, had to manage that, a lot of that stuff. They would be interrupted. You know, we would have management teams, management meetings, senior management meetings that would get very toxic because of the way that the black women would be going after each other in those meetings. They were two black women in particular, right? One dark skin and one a little bit lighter. And they were horrible, Right? And when I came in as a younger black women, woman, one of them was really, really, really horrible to me. She was very horrible to me. It was almost like she wanted me to prove that I had a right to be a director like she was. But what was interesting is that when my boss retired and the other woman was given his job, not the one who was a problem for me, the one who other one who I actually had a good working relationship, but when she got to be in charge, she turned into a terrorist. And she had a cadre of white women that she kept around her. They were like her little pets. And she sought to elevate them above everybody else, right? And she targeted the other black woman because she'd always disliked her. And I got caught in the middle of it. That's the first time I had to negotiate my way out of a bad work environment. And it was a black woman who perpetuated and created a horribly toxic, hostile work environment, right? So just because we're in charge doesn't always mean that things are going to be better because if we can't deal with our issues, right? If we use our power just to victimize people we don't like and elevate the ones that we do, we're not being any different than the people that we accuse of being bad to us when we weren't in positions of power. So these issues of colorism, of um, anti-black bias and racism is not just something that white people perpetuate. We do it too. I always tell people white supremacy works so well that it don't even really need white people anymore to survive because so many of us are doing the work for them that they can just sit back and watch, get some popcorn and watch it all unfold, right? So, and colorism is a huge driver of it. And it's not always the light-skinned person that's perpetuating it. A lot Sometimes it's the dark-skinned person who's perpetuating it against the light-skinned person because they make assumptions that this person is going to do this, this, and this, so let me go after them first. So, you know, we have groups within our communities who are doing horrible things to each other, but it's all, at the end of the day, driven by What? Whiteness, white proximity, white supremacy, because that's where we, we learned it from. And if the only point of having power for you as a black person is so you can do what white people have been doing, then what's, then that's not any power that you should want to have. If you just want to be able to do what they did and get away with it, how is that helpful to us as a community? So in the workplace, these things can show up and a lot of times we don't even put our finger on it. We can't put our finger on it, on what it is, right? That is going on, but people will go after other people on the job. People will be, you know, very hostile. Someone will be new and come into the work environment and other people will be very hostile to them because they're making assumptions about their abilities. They're making assumptions about how they're going to interact with them before they even have based on what they look like, like what kind of black person they think they are. Are they too, do they talk too properly? Do they speak um, in a way that they 
believed to be white. This whole idea of certain people acting white, what does that mean? What's the opposite of that? So that a person that can speak in a certain way, you call them white. So you're saying that what the opposite of that is that black people don't have the ability to be um, to, to string complete sentences together and articulate themselves in a certain way. That's kind of what you're saying, right? But we as black people are, are, are some of the biggest perpetuators of that kind of narrative that you, you are only black if you behave a certain way, if you speak a certain way, if you act a certain way, especially at work, and that if you don't, then you're the enemy, right? And so I think that these things can show up in that way. And then you have individuals who are white who hire people, right, based on their own biases and their own idea that the person that's more proximate to what they look like is going to do a better job than the person who is not. And then they put that person as the overseer to, to, you know, to crap the proverbial whip on their behalf. And then you create those kinds of dynamics as well. So I think it's really important for us to realize as black people that these things do also show up at work, right? That colorism is a real issue that can show up at work. And it's a difficult one to put your finger on and to name, right? It's a difficult one to name. Same as when, you know, you've got black people who are, are working in concert with or against each other in work environments because they're from the same island or they're from the same tribe or they're from the same, right? And they're, they're victimizing and targeting people that they perceive to not belong to the same group as them, right? And then the opposite of that is having a perception that because someone is from a country or an island that is not the United States and they hire another person that is from their place, that they're automatically going to come after you. That's also a problematic assumption. You always base how you deal with people on what they actually do, not what you think they're going to do, not even sometimes on what they say, because people can say one thing and do another. You've got to always carefully observe what people actually do. I say that all the time because it's key to proving whether there's discrimination present or other wrongdoing. It's not always what people say. Sometimes it is but it's what they do most. It, whether they say they do some, they're gonna do something and then they do the opposite, or they say they're gonna do something and they actually do it and the thing they said they were gonna do is a problem. All of those things, you gotta pay attention not just to what people say, but what they do. So you can't make assumptions about people. Just like we don't want white people to make assumptions about us. We don't want other non-white people of color to make assumptions about us. We've gotta be make, careful about not making assumptions about each other on the basis of appearance or how someone speaks or doesn't speak. Let what people's actions do speak for them, right? And so don't make an assumption that the light-skinned woman that came in as the manager is gonna be horrible just because she's light-skinned. Pay attention, but pay attention to what she does, right? Don't always think that because somebody looks just like you and they came from the same neighborhood that they're not in there um, helping, colluding, which with Karen, your the, the the big boss, around your demise. Pay attention to what people do, right? But recognize that these issues, right, are that play out in our larger society, play out at work as well, right? So you have to understand that it can be an issue, in some cases, and you've got to be we've got to be careful that we're not perpetrating the behavior that we don't want perpetrated against us in our larger society. We have to be aware that we are also often acting in ways that perpetuates a system that's harming all of us, but especially us, right? And so we've got to be aware of the fact that these things can be an issue because they, they don't go away. I mean, even if you look at where we are as a society now, I'm always thrilled when I see someone on television, even now, that looks more like me. Because it's still not the norm. It's still not the norm, right? But I'm grateful when I see more people that look more like me on television because at least now there actually is people that we can point to and say um, that there are more people on television and in entertainment and in sports and so on. I mean, every time I see Simone Biles whirl and twirl, it just warms my heart. It makes me so happy, 
in a way that I can't describe. And I know part of it is because she's not black. She's not just black. She's identifiably black. She can't be identified as anything else but black, right? And so, you know, when I was younger, there were only a handful of people. They were like Whoopi Goldberg and people would openly say that she was ugly, which I never believed that she was, but people would say that. Oprah Winfrey, they weren't that many dark-skinned black women on TV. Oprah was a big deal for me because when I was in high school, I would come home and she would be on the TV, right? But there weren't that many of us, right? And so I think that, you know, when, when I was really young, my mother loved Nina Simone and she's playing Nina Simone in the house all the time. And she was probably the only singer that I had ever seen on TV that was really dark skin. Um, so it's important for us to see people. What you see is what you can be. You know, when you see something, you can believe that you can be the thing that you see. If you don't see it, you know, representation actually matters. So it's important also in our workplaces to see people that look like us. I remember going to Africa for the first time um, in a job that I was in and I was over um, operations and I was the only black person, the, the first and the only. And I remember going to Africa to visit our offices and one of the women clasped my hands and she told me how much it meant to her to see a black woman that looked like her come to the office and be in charge and be welcoming because I, you know, I sat with everybody and I was very interested in knowing who they were and what they did and, 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 and thanking them for the, what they were contributing to the company and so on. And after the meeting, she came up to me and she, she almost had tears in her eyes. And she said she had never seen anyone that looked like her in a position of authority in this company, even though this company was doing work all over Africa. So to me, I was like, how can I be the first one when you're doing all this work in Africa? You should have people. You should actually have African people working in positions of authority because you're going into Africa to do this work. But everybody was white, right? And we're not always very respectful of the staff and so on. So, you know, she came up to me and said so, and other people came up to me at different meetings and were like so happy to see someone that looks like them because representation matters. Right. And it's someone that was identifiably black. That they didn't have to wonder who my daddy was, what my daddy looked like. That my daddy looked like their daddy. Right. I remember when I was out Kenyan, one of the women actually thought I was Kenyan. Right. So I think it's, you know, important for us to recognize that we have these biases. All of us have it as black people. I think colorism is an issue. All of us have, whether we want to admit it or not. Is something that I'm very aware of that I try to pay attention to and, and work on because I know that it was an issue that when I was younger, especially because you internalize what the rest of the world tells you about yourself and you have to intentionally decide to be different. It's not an easy thing and you have to be aware of what your biases are, you know, and so I do find it um, concerning when... I mean, I see, I, in, on one hand, I felt that the TV show Scandal, it's a very, very popular show. Um, and this is going to piss some people off, maybe, when I say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. And I loved the show because it was great to see a Black woman as the object of everyone's desire. And Carrie Washington is not a dark-skinned Black woman, but she's not like the lightest-skinned Black woman either. At least she doesn't appear that way on television. I've never seen her in person. And it was nice to see a black woman who was identifiably black. So she didn't look like Michelle Michael. She didn't look like Vanessa Williams, the you know the Miss, former Miss Universe. She didn't look like Miss USA, I think. Was she Miss America? One of them things. Um, Vanessa Williams. She, didn't, she wasn't Vanessa Williams black. She wasn't Halle Berry black. She wasn't... Um, Michael, Michelle, or Michelle Michael, I can't remember, the girl from New Jack City, light-skinned girl from that movie. She looked like one of them. She, she, she's identifiably black. Um, and it was nice to see someone that looked identifiably black be the object of everyone's desire. The only issue with that, I think, is that after Scandal, I think a lot of black women have latched on to the idea that in order to be the object of everyone's desire, they got to go find themselves a fits. 
they have to attach themselves to men that to white men that they perceive to have power and access and and i think that that's a concern to me right i think black women are beautiful and anybody that has good taste would would find us to be so so it doesn't surprise me that they're white men that have a preference for black women and that there are a lot more black women intermarrying. We're still less likely to marry outside of a race than black men, by the way, that's statistically a fact. And there are more black people statistically marrying other black people than any other types of marriages. That's also a data driven fact. But in the group of people that intermarry outside of their race or marry people primarily who are white, black men are more likely to do than black women. But I do, you know, I worry that um, what a lot of black women took away from that show is that that's what they needed to do was go out and get themselves a fit. I think if you meet someone that loves you and treats you well, it doesn't matter what color they are, go for it, knock yourself out. But America is a very racist country. And just because a white man is attracted to you doesn't mean he's not racist. Just means that he's attracted to black women. Doesn't mean he's not racist. Same for white women. So there's a danger in making that assumption. And I think that there are more of us making that assumption now than there used to be. And I worry about that because I worry about that, how that plays out in work at work as well. Right. And I have, you know, observed that, you know, there are more white men with the whole, my wife is black thing and thinking that that gives them a get out of um, racist free card. And it doesn't, I don't care who you're dating. I don't care what your children look like unless you have done the work to address your internalized white supremacist um, beliefs and you're white, you're racist. You can't even help it. You don't even, you don't have to wake up in the morning and say the N word. That doesn't mean that you're not racist, right? So because it's a system that you've been raised in to believe certain things about yourself, to believe yourself entitled certain things that you don't even realize that you believe. And so I do worry that, I worry about the scandal effect and how it shows up in the workplace as well, because I worry about the impact that that might be having in terms of how some of us interact with each other. Because the reverse is true that you think that because you have a white spouse at home, that you have proximity to whiteness and power that you don't necessarily have. And that can show up in the workplace and be very problematic and harmful in all kinds of different kinds of ways, right? So that's another issue that comes out of these issues of colorism and, and white proximity seeking. And there are people that also have this idea that I might be dark skinned, but if I can get a white person and make me some light skinned children, then that will give me some cachet. I'm just, I'm just talking about everything here, right? And I've come across people like that. I know some people, I know at least one person personally who I know for a fact, like intentionally um, went out and looked for that because of the inadequacies they had and the colorism issues. that they, And they were raised that way. They were taught that being light was better and they wanted some light-skinned kids and they went out and got some, right? And so I just want us to be aware of these things. Let's, I, I want us to stop pretending. We're aware. I want us to stop pretending that these things aren't a thing. I want us to stop pretending that the only issue is white people and that if white people would just do these things that we want them to do, everything would be groovy. It won't be groovy if we don't deal with these issues that we, we have also been harmed by white supremacy and we have internalized these inferiority complexes and beliefs about who is better based on color and all of these other things. And we've got to admit that we've got to actively work against it. All of us, whether we are biracial black people, whether we are um, multiracial, that the grandfather was, was the, the person who was white, wherever it came from. These approximations of hierarchy based on color are very problematic. And a lot of us are very invested in it, whether we admit it or not. Right. And it all comes from, it's fruit of the same white supremacy tree. And so we have to understand that we are also participating in keeping this stuff alive. It ain't just them. We're helping quite a bit. We are helping quite a bit. 
And so we have to stop being so helpful to the system, right? And a lot of it, it, and it's hard because you were taught this stuff. You're taught by what you saw on television. You're taught by your parents. You're taught by what you see your parents do, you know? And so these things play out and we don't even actually always recognize where they come from or why we believe one person is more attractive than another person, right? Why your grandmother treated this person, this cousin better than they treated the other cousin. Why was that, right? And it all comes from the same thing. And it has impacted all of us as black people, not just black Americans, the Caribbean, it's rampant. Africa, rampant. The stories I could tell about some of the things that I have seen and experienced on the continent of Africa, but we won't, we won't do that today. But all I'm saying is there's a lot of colorism and there's a lot of anti-black bias and it's right there. All of us are participating in it. It's not just white people. And if we want to solve these issues, we have to stop participating. And I think we have to be the ones to stop participating first. We have to be conscious of it and we have to be more supportive of each other at the in, in the workplace. That was something I really always tried to do and I would like to see more of us. We need to intentionally and actively support each other at work and stop all these nonsensical divisions that we are buying into. The who's more black and the a dose and it's just nonsense to me. We don't, we can't afford to divide ourselves and slice and dice ourselves in these ways. We have to unite and we have to support each other. We have to, because we will not survive if we don't. Right? So, you know, we have to recognize that colorism is a real thing. And then we have to make decisions about not buying into the notion that there are black people who are better or less better based on what their, their color looks like and how, 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 how much massa ran up and through their gene pool versus ours, you know, because he ran up and through everybody's gene pool. If you're black, you, your last name is the last name you had because of, of massa. It ain't even your real last name. Right. So we have stopped, got to stop buying into this stuff. We have to really actively divest ourselves from it. And be able to see it and identify it and call it for what it is when we recognize it happening in our workplaces as well as in our personal lives. Because these things come from how we were raised, what we have seen, um, what we have witnessed, some of which we can articulate, some of which we can't even articulate. It's just a part of what we know. And then it plays out at work. So I wanted to talk about this a little bit because I actually think it's something that we need to talk about more. I would be very interested to hear what people's comments are about um, how they have experienced or not experienced colorism in the workplace and how it showed up. Um, because I do think that it's a problem regardless of how it shows up, whether it is people being hired and given positions of um, power because of what they look like and because they have lighter skin or whether it is people who are um, demonizing or targeting people because they resent the idea of what they look like and they are doing it because they are lighter. Um, because I've seen them both, I've seen both things in the workplace, right? And so I do think um, we as black people have to get on the same page about this stuff and we have really got to stop the division. You know, some of the comments that I see black people make about um, the, the, the current democratic nominee for president, it really it concerns me because it's like, we are not where we need to be if we're sitting here having conversations about who's black and who's not black and letting, you know, white people drive the, you know, taking up their narrative about who's black and who's black enough and who's not black. It's, 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 it's ridiculous in my opinion. And so I really do think we need to get on the same page about this stuff and that we have to do better for ourselves. Um, and so I hope that this has been an interesting topic for you guys. And you can tell me what you think in the comments. This is Anne-Marie, the anti-HR, HR lady. HR is not your enemy, but they're definitely not your friend, but I am. And I'll see you in the next video.